Right, okay. Um, I'm going to start us off, I'm going to start by, by sharing uh, the screen. Um, thank you all for turning up, by the way. Um, this is not the greatest time, I do appreciate. Um, and we're going to try and do this. Uh, yeah, okay, can you all see that, first of all? Um, just just, just the, the, the title thing. And um, what I'm going to do first is we can start off with a quiz. Seven questions. They're all multiple choice. It doesn't matter what your level of French is. Um, just, um, just, just, just have a go, and uh, I will briefly unmute you when we go when we go through them. Um, but uh, uh, they're, you know, just just see how you get on. Um, some of them I think are easier than others. Um, but here's question number one: simple A, B, C, or D. Malheureusement, je dois partir. Unfortunately, I have to leave. Is it A, B, C, or D? Apologies if you're scrabbling around to get a pen. I think you'll see where I'm going with this in a minute. Of course, I'm telling you it's water. It could be neat scotch, but I'm sure you it isn't. Um, Okay, so that's the first one, A, B, C, or D. Number two, same thing. Le Vieux Château, the old castle. Is it A, B, C, or D? J'adore le rythme de cette chanson. A, B, C, O, D. Okay, number four now. La belle ville de Saint-Quentin en Yvelines. A, B, C, O, D. No prizes, incidentally, sadly. No. Paper pride. Yes, absolutely. Number five, les fleurs que Paul a acheté, the flowers which Paul bought. A, B, C, or D? Okay, last but one. 
Number six, l'usine se trouve à quelques 200 mètres de la maison. The factory is, uh, is situated at some 200 meters from the house. And finally, number seven, les reines se sont succédées. Uh, the, ren, uh, the, the queens followed one after the other. The queens succeeded one another. Is it A, B, C, or D? I'm going to briefly unmute all of you. Um, does anybody want me to go back over any of those? No? We're all okay? I'm going good. once. Yes. Sorry, was that someone? No? Nope? Okay. Just saying. Adjugé, vendu. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do then is we'll just go through these one by one. Um, and we'll see how we did. Um, I hope these weren't too painful. Number one, malheureusement, je dois partir. Anyone? A, B, C, or D? Nandy? B? B, yes, I, I thought you said E for a minute, which would have been an ingenious answer. Um, no, it is, it is B, obviously, um, because it's the je form which takes the uh, S, as opposed to the uh, il form, which would be A, which takes T. Now, you're already beginning to see something that French makes you do. You hear the same sound, but you've got to know your grammar to know which one's which. Is it first person, uh, is, is it uh, first person, as in this case, or second person? or third person. Uh, D-O-I-E-N-T -D doesn't exist, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, Dwa does exist, D-O-I-G-T, uh, um, which is a, a, a finger, obviously, a, a digit, if you like. Um, and, um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an example of how French is very uh, rich in, in homonyms. Um, Le Vieux Château. Anybody want to go on that one? Oh, have you all gone um, muted again? Right, you're unmuted. Anyone, anyone want to offer me on anything on uh, number two? D. Is it D? D? It is D, Chris. Yes, well done. Um, Release. Good. Um, the reason that it's got a circumflex there is that French likes to tell you whether there used to be an S in uh, Latin. Um, so, for example, here we've got Castellum, and what happened in Old French, um, this was very much a working class-led change. There's, um, there's a class element to this, which I'll come back to later on, um, whereby the final syllables were eroded, and it was very much a working class-led change. Um, so we went from Castellum to Castel, uh, Castel, and in the same way as Cockneys swallow their L's, they vocalise them, so Bell becomes Bell. So Castel became something like Castel, which became Cateau, which became, in the north of France it still is Cateau, and uh, in Paris that uh, um, palatalized to Ch, so Chateau. Um, so sometimes um, if, you can, if, you, if you see a circumflex in a word, it might be an indication that there used to be an S there, and sometimes that might, that might help you out. Um, but, uh, oh, hang on. Um, but... Um, uh, we see it, for example, also in uh, hôpital, where there's a circumflex. Uh, J'adore le rythme. I thought this one was quite a nasty one, actually. Um, anyone like to um, make me an offer on three? Judging from its, its etymology, it should be D, because yeah. it comes from the Greek. Um, but I think the correct answer is actually C. Well done, sir. Absolutely spot on. Um, did everybody else get C here? 
this is this is quite an interesting one actually because um, it used to be um, it used to be written rhythme with a, with an r h y t h m e until 1878 um, and getting rid of the first Greek h the the the, the h there and the t with with the uh, with the r and with the t are both to indicate that this word is of Greek origin the same way as the um, circumflex is telling you that there used to be an s there in Latin. And the H is telling you this is of Greek origin. Of course, Y in French, Y, the clue is in the name, is also there to tell you that it has a uh, Greek origin. Now, French, again, feels it's got to tell you about the Greek origins, but they can't be consistent about this. D would kind of be logical. Um, uh, rythme with, with the T, uh, TH, but not the RH, is kind of a halfway out. My pref preference would be A, actually. Um, I don't see why a modern spelling system needs to tell you what the, etymolo the etymology of things, things is. I'm not sure that's a particularly important thing to do. And of course, in Italian, they don't bother. Um, it's ritmo. Why don't you write it R-I-T-M-O? Um, Italian doesn't have the same hang-ups that French does about telling you what the origins of words are. Um, La Belle, I thought this one was fairly straightforward. Anybody um, like to make, make me an offer on uh, number four? Ah, you smell a rat, don't you? Um, it's spelled the same way in English, isn't it? It is, yes, it's Saint, so, so it's it's sa. Um, Saint does exist, S-E-I-N, it means breast or at the centre of something, or sa de quelque chose. Sa, as in sa is sauf, means healthy, and sa, C-E-I-N-T, means enclosed. Again, um, French is a word that uh, is, is a language that's very, very rich in homonyms, and it's to do with the fact that um, final consonants in particular stop being pronounced. Um, we see this particularly from the 16th century onwards. It's very much a working class led change. And um, in many cases, it's gone right through the system so that the words are never pronounced. But in some cases, you get a hangover, for example, in, in liaison. And um, because, of course, uh, this was a, a working class led change was to get rid of final sounds, um, in, particularly in, in monosyllables. And middle and upper class people resisted it because if you pronounce these final letters, you showed you were literate. And to be literate, of course, was to know Latin. So you kind of get a double whammy there. You know, you're, you, you get a, a certain prestige that comes from that. And the, the, the kind of throwback to that in modern French, I think, is that um, politicians in particular, when they want to show that they know what they're talking about, will throw in uh, liaisons. Um, so you will get things like, um, il est trop important instead of trop important. Now, um, again, this is a sign of education. It's, uh, some of them we all do, ils font, but ils ont. That's a liaison that everybody has, an obligatory one. But there are some that are optional and some people just don't know them. So I asked 96 kids in four different Franc Francophone cities to read me out, uh, vous êtes trop aimable. Um, and of the 96, about half of them said, vous êtes trop aimable. Of the remaining 50%, two-thirds said trop aimable, which is odd because there's no Z there at all, and the other got it right and put the uh, and got the P in. So this is a this is um uh this this is something that, that is quite tricky even for French for French speakers. Um but the reason for the homonyms, of course, is the final consonants not being pronounced in the in, in, in the modern language. Les fleurs que Paul a acheté. Ah, this is a tricky one. Um any thoughts on this? Can it be A or D? Because I find this really confusing myself. Yeah. And You're in good company, Chris, because the French do as well. So I think it's D. I, you think mm. it's D, Maria? I do, yeah. The answer is D. Well Yay. done. <laughs> it is D. Um, does anybody know why? Maria, do you know why? The direct object, most agree. That's and right, yes. the, 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 the ruling is that a preceding direct object, what did Paul actually buy, les fleurs, agrees in number and gender with, uh, uh, a part participle agrees with the preceding direct object, the PDO agreement as it's called. That's been there since 1823. I had a little look at the Noël et Chapsal thing and it, the explanation, the example goes on for about three or four pages. At no point do Noël et Chapsal even bother to say why this is a good idea. 
<laughs> um, now, French kids are tortured with this, with their daily dictée in France having to learn all this nonsense. It doesn't help. It, you, can't, you, you, almost can, you almost never can hear the, uh, the occasionally, you know, les chaussures que j'ai mises à côté, but very, very rarely can you hear it. This is, this is an example of uh, a, a spelling rule for its own sake, really, but um, something that the French set great store by. I'll come back to that in a minute. L'usine se trouve à quelques 200 mètres de la maison. Anyone? Is it A? Is it A? Should, was that you, Becky? Becky, Zoe? Oh, Zoe. Sorry, hi, Zoe. Zoe, it looks like it should be, doesn't it? And very often, quelques will be that. But the answer, in fact, is C. Um, the reason is, if you're talking about some friends, quelques amis, quelques frères, quelques, uh, quelques livres, then it's an adjective. It qualifies that particular noun. But here, it means some as in the sense of approximately. The factory is situated at some 200 meters from the, from the house. Okay? And that some is essentially an adverb. You could replace it by approximately. What do we know about adverbs in French? They're invariable. If you got that wrong, folks, um, you're in very good company. Um, a lot of French people do as well. Um, and again, it's one of those things we can't hear. You have to know your grammar quite well to understand why that works. Um, and yeah, I, I, have, I have sympathy here. Um, so when it went, quelque means approximately, then it has no uh, agreement. Um, A and um sorry b and d i don't think exist uh, they certainly haven't existed for a long while if they ever did a does exist but it's when kelka is adjectival i'll take my basic a1 french and <laughs> big pardon i'll take my basic a1 french and be okay with it then you will and and, and zoe it would not surprise me in the least i mean it, it, this is very easy for me to say i've been doing this stuff for 25 30 odd years um, and I can always catch French people out with some of these things because I'm thinking about these things day in and day out and they're not. But, you know, I've got some very, very highly educated French people who are terrified by these things. And very often it's actually Brits who can't speak the language as well because we're not natives who actually know the spelling rules better because they've had to learn them. So, you know, don't worry, you're in good company and there will be lots of French people who will struggle with this a lot more than you do. Um, les reines se sont succédées. Um, I thought this was possibly the most difficult, actually. Any thoughts? Go on, Maria. I think it's D. It's, I think D? it's D. Yes, most French people do think it's D. It looks like it should be D, doesn't it? The answer is A. <laughs> um... Yeah, I'd, I'd like I'd like a pound for every French person I've caught out on this. Um, I'm for my sins. I'm a bit of a fan of rugby league, and I looked up the uh, website of the Catalan Dragons team, and they said nos équipes se sont succédées with the agreement exactly as you suggested, Maria. The reason why it's not D is because this looks like it's a direct object, but in actual fact it's not because in French you succédé à quelqu'un. So therefore, although it precedes, it's an indirect object. Therefore, no agreement. In the even, though, sorry, even though it's a reflexive verb and they always agree, agree in gender and a number? Absolutely, yeah. Because you're not agreeing with a direct object, and that's the point. It's like, okay. you know, ils se sont dit bonjour. What did they actually say? Bonjour, and that comes afterwards. They said it to each other. The, 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 the devil here is in the se, because se can be the direct object and the indirect object. Of course, if we were in the singular, there won't be a problem. Lui a succédé. Well, you know, you smell a rat straight away. You're not going to make an agreement with lui, but you would with, with, with le hola. Okay. Um, did anybody get all seven? Six? Five? Any fives? Yes. Excellent. Um, four? Less than four. I'm not hearing anybody less than four, which is uh, thoroughly in, in, in encouraging, actually. Um, and as I say, I, if I'd done this with 
um, well-educated francophone people, I don't think they would have done any better than you, um, because this, 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 this is, these are the kind of areas that create difficulties. Um, now, lest anybody thinks, well, here he is, he's sitting up in his little garret in Herne Bay, and he's pontificating about a country that he's not even living in at the moment and, you know, being all smug about how terrible French spelling is and, oh, doesn't it need uh, attention? Well, I'm certainly not going to pretend that English, English spelling is sensible. It is not. English spelling is just nuts and it's not even logical. French spelling is logical, but you need a PhD to understand what the logic is. English, don't bother. There isn't any logic. But, you know, just, just, just. I think it's worth pointing out, you know, um, my children have both given up French. I mean, it shows what, how good a teacher I am, isn't it? You know, and they gave up French. Oh, I don't want to do French, Dad. The, 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 the words just don't correspond to what they say. At least in Spanish, it sort of corresponds to what I'm, what I'm saying. Um, and my daughter makes the same argument for German. So German and Spanish for them, but not French, please. And they say, well, there's all these silent letters. Well, you know, what about the H in our? Does anybody still pronounce the E in reader, which is what it looks like it should be, but it's not, of course, it's ride. Um, if you're from the West Country, you might pronounce the R in cart horse, but you're certainly not going to pronounce the E, and most of us don't pronounce the R. Calm, no L in that. Right, G-H, zilch, W, not doing anything. And what's worse about english spelling i think is that it's aligned with the way things were spoken in in the medieval period probably around about 13 12 1300 it's it's about right look at those short vowels oh sorry let's go back um look at these short vowels um in mat met and mit now look what happens when we put the e afterwards and we make that vowel longer so not mat but mate what's happened is that the a vowel moved up one from a to e. This is something called the Great English Vowel Shift. So mat become, mater became something like meter and eventually became mate. Look at that double e. It should be pronounced, if you think about it, if, if the e, e in met is e, then that should be met. It's not. It's meat because the e sound moved up one to e. And you can feel your tongue moving up one as you go, a, e, e. Now, when you get to e, there's nowhere left to go. So um, what happened was that this vowel diphthongized. So it starts off as something like a, and it ends up as something like e. So might. Okay, the, your tongue goes for a little wander. It's what we call a diphthong. Okay. Um, which is why we, when we borrow words, borrow quite modern words like ski, for example, the e, the, the i is still pronounced like an e, as it should be, and as it used to be in English. Whereas in old words from English, of course, the, 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 the spelling doesn't correspond to the pronunciation at all. Crazy. Similar things could be made for, similar arguments could be made for coat, uh, coot, and, and loot, and so on, where again, the, 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 the spellings are out of step. Take coot, for example, it should be coot, but it's not, it's moved up from or to u. If you want an, ex an example, I, I, I sometimes say to my students, look, imagine that a Martian comes to earth and they say, well, look, you know, take us to your leader. Actually, let's, let's scrub that for the moment. That's not really not a good idea, I think. Um, but um, we've, you, 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 you've clearly been very successful, you humans. What's your secret? Well, our secret is language. We've got this fantastic way of communicating. It means we can share ideas, we can advance, we can learn and so on. Um, we've got this fantastic language at the moment that's probably more dominant than any other. It's called English. And it's got this fantastic spelling system in which we've got O-U-G-H can be written uh, in exactly the same way, but it's pronounced in nine different ways. There's no rhyme or reason to them in any case. And in none of them is the G or the, out, or the H pronounced. You'd be getting back on your spaceship as fast as your little, legs, little Martian legs could carry you, wouldn't you? This is just bananas. And, you know, people have to learn this. I mean, I, I, I really take my hat off to anyone who's a non-native speaker of English and has to learn English spelling, because this is just weird. So I'm not trying to make the case that English is in any sense more sensible than French spelling. But there is a difference. Um, my father left school at 15. Um, I, um, as because of the nature of the job I do, I have got more 
postgraduate qualifications than is sensible for a human being to have. And yet I would go to my father to get advice on spelling rather than the other way around because dad could read things and he just knew what looked right. And he was invariably right and, you know, could teach me a thing or two. If I and my father were French, I don't think that would be possible. And we saw some of the problems that French spelling throws up earlier on, and it is clearly a worry for the French. There are regular um, comments on la crise de l'orthographe. Orthographe, orthography, posh word for spelling, correct ortho writing uh, grapheme. Um, so uh, there, there, there are regular complaints that um, the French are getting worse at spelling. Um, I was going to try and find some more up-to-date figures, but of course with lockdown I can't get access to my books at the moment. But um, in a sense, I think the fact that Desiré and Ordé, my source here, um, one of the books I looked at as an undergraduate in the 80s, um, the fact that they were making this point getting on for 50 years ago, I think kind of makes my point for me. And they said, look, we've looked at a, a dictation that was taken for people trying to get into the Ecole Normale, uh, you know, one of these um, uh, elite uh, universities. Um, you all know about Ecole Normale d'Administration, which creates uh, France's uh, leaders and its captains of industry. And they said, well, look, we, we, we looked at the results for the same dictation between 1951 and 1971. And in 1950, we got one candidate out of 59 who scored naught, uh, but there were two who got full marks. One fall to 1971, and we've got 27 candidates out of 98 who score naught. And the highest mark is not 20 anymore, it's 16, and only one candidate managed this. So there is evidence that... French kids are finding this tougher. And we look at the uh, average mark in 1951, it was 15.6. In 1971, this had fallen to six. You can find all the details on that. Um, if you look at Dizzy Arnaud's book, I'll give you the reference to it later on. But basically, it's pretty grim reading um, if you're a fan of French spelling. So, reformers look at that and they come to a number of conclusions. First thing they say is, well, look, standards are declining. This is because the system is needlessly complicated. There's not enough time in the system. Um, teachers are under pressure. They can't teach all this. It's far too difficult for people to cope with. We, we've got a system that is not fit for purpose. And it's worse than that. France is a country that has done its best with varying degrees of success to try and get rid of the kind of old school tie element that you see in British society. We're not going to give you jobs on the basis of who your dad was, what school you went to, what tie you wear, what accent you've got. We're going to give you competitive examinations because they will at least be fair. But the problem was um, that for a long while, you would get people who were potentially very good engineers, very, very good doctors who would go in and they'd make one or two mistakes in their written work and uh, they would be eliminated on that basis. And there's a huge potential waste of talent there. M Martinet, uh, André Martinet, a very, French, a very famous French linguist, made the point that, you know, if, you, if, if we took away the time that's given up to the daily dicte, dictation in French schools, and we get people spending more time on their maths, more time on their physics, more time on their geography, then we would not be behind uh, other nations that don't have this particular burden on them. And I'm slightly iffy about this one, but um, linguists said, look, you know, when, when people are deciding what language they're going to learn, um, do they go for French? Do they go for German? Do they go for English? Um, and they say, well, look, when you've got a spelling system that's as hard as that, it, it puts people off. Now, I have some sympathy with that argument because I've seen it with my own kids. You know, oh, can't be doing with French, you know, you, you, you don't pronounce half the letters. Um, however, at the end of the day, English spelling is not in a position to throw any stones either, and everybody wants to learn English. Um, at the end of the day, the language we learn is the language that we think is going to be helpful for us. And there's, 
no shortage of people in places like Algeria or Tunisia who still want to perfect their French because they've got connections with uh, the French Euro European mainland, they want to trade with them and so on. So it's, um, I, I, I think that is probably the weakest of the arguments. Um, Conservatives, however, come along, and uh, this is what I, I find particularly interesting about France. It tends to equate good French with written French. In Britain, we're more inclined to look at good English as being associated with the accents of power. Um, I, 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 I mean, I, I, I found this absolutely appalling. I don't know, are any of you familiar with Steph McGovern? Um, presents a breakfast show on TV. It, it, I mean, this woman is hot stuff. I mean, she's, she's uh, an experienced business journalist. She invented something at the age of 18 that saved Black and, Black and Decker 100 grand a year. Um, she's a very, very good presenter. But the only thing anybody knows her for is she's got a Middlesbrough accent. And somebody wrote in once and said, you know, please give Steph McGovern 20 quid towards this 20 pound note towards elocution lessons so she can learn to speak properly. Now, I, I, you know, I'm just appalled by that. You know, if this, I would have found that unacceptable in 1915, but this was 2015. So we have our snobberies as well. But in France, uh, the notion of what good French is associated with, with, with writing. And if you're going to think in those terms, then you see these complexities and these etymological spellings as somehow beautiful. You're doing violence to the, the language itself if you try and reform the spelling. My argument there would be that in the 20s, um, Turkish stopped using Arabic alphabet, which wasn't really suited to it, and it used a version of a Latin alphabet, um, which was more um, in line with uh, the, uh, the, the, the Turkish sound system. Nobody died. Turkish did not change one jot. Turkish was still Turkish. People were still able to communicate with one another. The fact that the whole writing system had been changed and hugely changed did not affect Turkish at all. And we'll see in a minute that there have been some changes to French spelling. And again, the French seem to have survived them. But you suggest changing the spelling in France at your peril, because for some people, this is attacking the language itself. Um, the other thing that you tend to hear from conservatives is that it's a, the, the, the problem is not the system. The problem is not the spelling system itself. The problem is the education. It's these damn teachers. They can't get it right. They need to get their fingers out and do this thing properly. And there's an irony in this. You know, 50 years ago, Desirat and Orde were saying these positions had hardly changed in 50 years. And they're still the same kind of arguments, as we'll see in a minute, that were coming out 20 years ago and to some extent today as well. Okay. Um, French orthography. Uh, orthography, as I say, posh word for spelling. Um, what are the problems? I would say that there are four main problems that cause a, this mismatch between the written and the spoken language. The first thing we saw is etymological spelling. French feels the need to tell you where words have come from. They want to retain something of the Latin. And as I say, I think there's a, there's a class thing in that. The people who did know Latin, the people who had a classical education, and the people who were literate wanted to tell you about that. They wanted to retain a spelling system that suited them and kept the riffraff out. And we're going to see in a minute a quotation that says almost that in as many words. The second problem is sound change. You get um, words that used to sound different and now they don't, which means you get different combinations making the same sound and sometimes the same sound, uh, same letter doing more than one job. Um, why I said that my father was good at spelling is because he knew about these anomalies. He knew there was a GH in right that isn't pronounced. And once you know it, you know it. France has a lot, of, French has a lot of these, same as English does. Um, uh, uh, in, in these, these sort of everyday spelling issues. Is it one R or two? Is it F or PH? Those kind of things. Um, that's what the French call orthographe lexicale or orthographe d'usage. You've just got to learn them. End of. Okay. But where I think France, uh, French is different from other languages in the extent to which you have to know your grammar in order to be able to spell. Orthographe grammaticale. And this is something that is kind of... Um, it's, uh, what's the word? Um, not the Holy Grail. It's something that one must not touch. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to argue with. So, 
Um, let's deal with these one by one. Um, etymological spelling. Um, th there were some, a number of things going on here. Um, French spelling was largely established in the 13th century by early civil servants, if you like, who had kind of got out of the habit of writing um, uh, Latin, or they'd been encouraged to stop writing Latin. By the 16th century, they're actually being told, you must not write Latin anymore. Um, but of course, they've been schooled in Latin, and they are, they find it natural to retain a Latinate spelling. There was also, it has been pointed out, the fact that very often these guys were paid by the word or by the page. So if they could fill out extra letters, they could get fewer words per line and get paid a bit more. So they had no interest whatsoever in, uh, in, in simplifying the spelling. Um, so you get the H being retained in words like um and uned, even though the H sound had been lost from late Latin. You know, it wasn't even used by uh, in, in, the, in, in the, uh, the latter stages of, uh, of, of the Roman period. Not only that, these patriciens, they weren't fantastically well educated and they made mistakes. So the word, for example, for hedgehog is hérisson, le hérisson. And uh, it has an H at the beginning because um, Praticien thought that there was an H in the Latin. In actual fact, it, there wasn't. Um, this comes from Ericionem, um, uh, which became Erisson. Um, French retains these Greek letters, as I say. Y is Y. It had never occurred to me what that meant, Greek I. But uh, that's the reason for it, folks. And we find these uh, PHs, THs, and CHs and Ys all over the place indicating the origins of those words. And as we've seen, um, S's uh, very often were replaced by circumflexes, but the accent is very often there to tell you they used, needlessly in my point, from my point of view, is there to tell you that there used to be an S. Sound change. Um, lots and lots of languages have to cope with sound change. Um, English being a very obvious and egregious example of this. Um, we're in no position to throw stones, but it does throw up some real difficulties. Um, you guys, all being uh, a lot younger than me, will probably look at me um, in amazement, but uh, the word for Monday I was taught at school is lundi. Not lundi, lundi. And one is un. So uh, number one is uh, un. But the uh, depart département which has the number one on the number plate is le département de l'Ain, A-I-N. Okay? Similarly, brun, brown, but brun as in a blade of grass. Now, I, I, 10, 15 years ago, there would always be a French person in my seminar and I could get them to say that and they'd look at me as a stance as if to say, we haven't said this for years. Now they can't even pronounce it. Un has gone. Um, and this is a change that seems to have started around about the, the turn of the century. And we know it was a problem around about 1900 because grammarians start complaining about it. Martinon, in a book called Comment on prononce le français, a book written for French people, but actually boils down to Comment je prononce le français, says, Il n'y a guère de faute plus choquante que celle qui consiste à dire le, val, le, le voyel de vin dans un mot comme un. This is uh, a classic example of a grammarian trying to push back the tie because that change is coming in. These days, lundi, un, vin, brun, brun. The problem, of course, is that whereas un used to be un and in used to be un, they're now all un. And on top of that, you've got un for ça, you've got un in amiens. Which one are you going to go for? It gets tricky and then not, not much rhyme or reason to it. Um, there was, um, when I lived in France, there was an advert, uh, I don't suppose any of you will have seen it or remember it, but there was an advert for a particularly posh type of pasta. And you had this beautiful 18th century house adorned with chandeliers and wine waiters and uh, lovely paintings on the walls and all the rest of it. And the voiceover said, Mon cher, ce soir on va manger des pâtes. We're going to eat pasta tonight. Pot, P-A circumflex T-E-S. And the point of the, the, the advert was, look, don't go down to bloody Antermarché and pay two euros for a, a, a pasta. Get the stuff that posh people have. 
like these. Get the better quality stuff from us, which costs a bit more, but it's better quality. And you know these guys are posh people because you can see the house and they are so posh, they still say part. And they distinguish it from pat, which means animal's paw. These days, no one does. Not pat, part, mal, mal. Incidentally, if any of you find anybody who still does that, please bring them to me so I can do some tests on them or something. But, you know, they, these, they, people like that really are very in very short supply these days because that would be pat, 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 mal, mal. But to remember which one has the circumflex, you've got to know which one used to be pronounced pat and mal. And that's tricky. Um, I've looked at a, a number of websites this afternoon um, where I've seen things like uh, there, um, everyone went to their room, T-H-E-R-E. -E. Um, your, why are you're kidding, Y-O-U-R. If you can't hear the difference, it's difficult to get the spelling right. And French presents you with a lot of things like that. Um, th the last one is quite an interesting one. Um, événement. Um, there are three E's in French. E on its own is pronounced E uh, or it's dropped. E with, a, with an uh, acute accent is E and E with a grave accent is E. Eh. And the rule is that generally speaking that if the vowel is the last thing you hear within a syllable, it's what we call an open syllable, then it's pronounced E. If it's in a closed syllable, that's a syllable that ends in a consonant, then you pronounce it eh. So, when événement used to be pronounced as événement, e grave, v, e grave made sense. The problem was that we now drop that third e. We don't say événement, we say événement. That means we have the second syllable is now ven, which means we have a grave accent. It's not e anymore, but e. Eh. No one says événement, they say événement. So that should be a grave. And in avènement, a more recent word, the advent of something, the accent is correct. This was something that the dictionaries finally budged on a few years ago, and you can now pronounce it with e, e grave v, e, uh, e acute v, e acute, um, or e acute v, e grave. You can spell it either way, but it took a long, long while for them to, to move on that one, and most people. Certainly, le, le, le Monde will still pronounce that with, we still write that with two uh, e, e acutes, even though that spelling no longer corresponds to the pronunciation. Um, we then have a final problem, which is that uh, in some cases we have a, a, a consonant that's not normally pronounced, like the P in trop, but in some circumstances it might reappear. Il est trop important. Okay, a um, little anecdote on this one. Um, a famous prime minister who no one will name, I would just love to find out who it was, was talking about um, uh, François Mitterrand. And what he wanted to say was when Mitterrand was a minister, and God knows he was a minister often enough. And what he said was, quand Mitterrand était ministre, et Dieu sait qu'il a beaucoup pété. He then realized his mistake because beaucoup pété could mean he was it a lot. But of course, beaucoup pété means he farted a lot. Um, and uh, anyway, what happened was that the, 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 this, this prime minister very, very quickly corrected himself. He kept his, his liaison. But what he said was, Dieu sait qu'il a beaucoup été. To make it quite clear what he was doing. He didn't want to lose the liaison because the liaison made him look important and educated. But at the same time, he didn't want to confuse été and pété, which are clearly not the same thing. I, if any of you ever find out who that prime minister was, please let me know, because it's, it's, it's one of the great unsolved mysteries of French linguistics. Um, but yes, uh, uh, a, a nice little issue involving a final letter that's normally silent, but can reappear under certain circumstances, and of course affects the spelling. Now, autographe lexical, autographe d'usage, um, many of the reform proposals that have been mooted tend to address these things. So for example, jeter um, goes to je jette, j'appelle, um, but puller goes to je mène and j'appelle exactly, in exactly the same way. 
but um, there are two ways of doing it. You can either double up the um, you can either double up the, the, the consonant, or you can put in a graph. And French is inconsistent about which it does. Similarly, with compound words, these are a nightmare. Do you have no hyphen? Do you have two words? Do you have a hyphen? Um, how do you do the plurals? Ugh, complete nightmare. Double letters, charrette, but why chariot? Um, quick quiz for you. Um, and that is, uh, how many, how many uh, ways uh, can you spell donner? Donner. Anyone? Give me a number. Zoe, can I have a guess? Not really. More than one. Good, good. This is what we like to hear. It's definitely more than one. Donny, anyone? Six, seven, six or seven. Six or seven, up a bit. Ten. Ten, well done. It is ten. Um, here they are. Um, there's the three imperfects. Donné, donné, donné. There's the four past participles, because of course you've got the agreement forms. E acute E, E acute S, and so on. There's the past past simple which is donné these uh, uh, of course the the, the um, imperfect used to be donné but they're now donné for most people same as the past historic which is a problem then you've got your infinitive and of course you've got your um you, you've got your imperative as well um of course if donné means uh, data then that is uh, donné e -A -Q -E -S -2. anyway um what happens when people start trying to reform um this was an interesting quote from uh, uh, the Académie Française from 1694. Um, la compagnie déclare qu'elle désire suivre l'ancienne orthographe qui distingue les gens de lettres d'avec les ignorants et les simples femmes, qu'il faut la maintenir partout, hormis dans les mots où un lent et constant usage on aura introduit uh, une contraire. The company declares that it wishes to follow the old orthography which distinguishes men of letters from ignorant men and from simple women. Remember, women didn't get an education in those days. So, you know, to say you spelt like a woman was to say you couldn't read, essentially. And that this should be maintained generally, except in those words which long constant usually uh, introduce an alternative spelling. We want a spelling that keeps the riffraff out, is basically what that's saying. So, reform proposals have tended to be tepid. 1835, if you look at very old French texts, you'll see um, imperfects in OIS, OIT, and so on. They were changed to AIT, AIS, and so on, because uh, there was a change in the spoken vowel. Um, the T of parent was restored, because the plural in plural of parent used to be P-R-A-R-E-N-S, and so on. Um, that, uh, uh, and, and so th th those, those plurals were aligned there. Um, that's about as far as it got. Um, 20th century reforms, generally what happens is the academy says maybe at first, then there's a backlash and then the academy says no, and the compromise is they introduce something called a tolerance. We will tolerate this. Now think about the first time you took your first boyfriend or girlfriend home to your parents. Imagine if you turn around, they turn around and said, yes, we can tolerate him or her. It's not exactly a ringing endorsement, is it? If the highest authority on language in the land is is saying we will tolerate this the suggestion is that we prefer no change okay um here was a, a, a the, the kind of things that they've allowed a tolerance on la foule d'homme que j'ai vu um now is it uh was it the crowd la foule that you saw which would in, which would require an e uh, 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 an e agreement or was it les hommes that you saw s Strictly according to the Academy, it's la foule, so therefore the agreement is E, but they'll let you off if you put an S. I would prefer you had nothing, frankly. Um, and there have been various reforms in the 20th century. There was one, I think it was Billy in 61, um, and the, the word got out in the press that all the words that are written um, are pronounced all. That's A-U, A-U-X, E-A-U, E-A-U-X, A-U-L-X, heads of garlic, or um, as in O, circumflex, and the five or six others, they were all going to be pronounced O. This wasn't true, but this was the headline in the press, oh, what's going to happen to our language? And the proposals were quietly shelved. So you had attempts to reform spelling that get nowhere. The one that kind of did have a bit of legs was 1990. Um, but what this focused on was basically these little anomalies, these octographe du sage things. They got rid of most um, hyphens. They got rid of most circumflexes, except where it distinguishes homonyms like du and du. Regularization of double letters. So you now got a double R in chariot. Plurals of compound nouns. Um, 
there was a, a real backlash against this, as we'll see in a minute. But finally, the possibility of using them in school textbooks came from 2016. Um, Le Monde still won't accept them, I don't think, but school textbooks will allow the alternative spelling. Here's a kind of reaction that these proposals aroused. Um, Yves Berger, who was a literary critic in a book called, uh, in a magazine called Lire, Stupide, Inutile, Dangereuse. Uh, C'est une entreprise, uh, and I've spelt that wrong. How, what an awful thing to do in a, in a talk about spelling. I've made a spelling mistake. Stupide, Inutile, Dangereuse. C'est une entreprise qui relève de la pure démagogie. Démagogie is fighting talk in France. You know, this is playing to the gallery. It's talking to the plebs. De l'esprit de Saddam Hussein. Stupid, useless, dangerous. This is an exercise in pure populism, straight out of the mind of a Saddam Hussein. Well, you know, I mean, who's to say which is worse? You gas 30,000 of your own people in one afternoon, you miss off the odd circumflex. I mean, it's so difficult to say, really, isn't it? Um, a bit of an overreaction, methinks. Um, Daniel Mitterrand, however, this is the wife of the then president. She's somebody. Um, she was a very, very respected figure. Um, almost across the political spectrum. And she makes an argument that you often hear in the context, um, in the British context too, about speaking nicely, i.e. having a standard English accent, RP. Quand je vois le laxisme à propos de l'orthographe, je suis effondré. Ce laxisme en entraîneur d'autres. L'orthographe d'abord, puis pourquoi pas le moral. When I see standards of spelling being allowed to stay, I'm horrified. Loosening standards is a slippery slope. Once you've let things slip with spelling, why shouldn't morality go the same way, ladies and gentlemen? Ooh, not an argument that I buy as a linguist. So to kind of tie this up, really, um, linguists, people like me, people who worry about these things for a living, um, they're broadly supportive of reform, and, and there was one linguist, Michel Ancov, um, Pierre Ancovet, sorry, not Michel Ancovet, Pierre Ancovet, who was part of uh, Michel Rocard's team in 1990, um, was charged with um, putting forward some of these changes. But the problem with going the whole hog and making French spelling correspond more closely to the, um, uh, to, to, to the way it's pronounced is that um, you've got to decide which is the correct pronunciation. And that, in a sense, kind of defeats the object. I mean, why, for example, um, I, I've taken the example of lac meaning lake and lacquer meaning, um, meaning a lacquer. Um, if you wrote them down both as L-A-K, because that's what Parisians say, you're kind of ignoring the fact that Southerners say lacquer. They still pronounce those mutes. So you've got two solutions, and neither of which is particularly practical. On the one hand, you could either impose Parisian pronunciation and say that's your basis for standard spelling. Seems a bit elitist. Or on the other hand, you could just allow anything goes, you sort of um, have any pronunciation according to the way you say it. But that makes reading rather difficult because we don't, you know, we recognize a word and we moved on. You know, the only people who read every single sound in a word are children when they're learning. And we very quickly move on from that. So it wouldn't be particularly, um, particularly practical. My view is that the reforms that we've had, they've all focused on the little stuff and not the big stuff. I think where French needs to start is the orthographe grammatical. Quand je serai président de la République, ladies and gentlemen, it will be the preceding direct object wall that is up against the wall on day one. I see no point to that at all. I think we could be bolder too in uh, aligning some of the other um, anomalies um, uh, in, in, in terms of the grammar. I think there are final letters that don't need to be there because they mark um, uh, particular grammar things. Um, I, I, I think we could be much bolder. But the problem is, if you try to be bold, the French will feel you're attacking the language. If you make it too timid, in a sense, it's hardly worth it because you're just complicating things. Thanks very much, folks. Um, so the general General conclusion then is you get proposals that find initial approval, you then get a tolerance, or the, the academy says, well, let's faire l'usage, let's wait and see what usage dictates. But the game's up when they do that. They know what they want, and that's essentially what happens. Um, France's citizens still tend to see reform as well. It's like attacking the Queen Mother or the Beatles. You know, you just don't do it. This is part of our heritage. It's something that we you, you, that, that, that must not be touched. So I fear that French citizens are, are going to have the de drill of daily dicte for many years to come. And apparently the, the uh, biggest um, 
uh, audience ratings for any show on a Sunday afternoon, apart from the French National Rugby Cup final, is the Championnat d'Orthographe, which is literally a dictation, which hundreds of thousands of people take. It's a, an absolute stinker. There's normally about two or three people in the country get every one of them right. But at the French find absolutely fascinating. It was set up by Bernard in 1985, and it still attracts huge ratings, or at least it did last time I saw. I don't know whether Bernard has moved on and given it to someone else now. Okay, folks, thanks very much. I'm going to stop recording now, and I'm also going to unmute you. Um, so if there are any questions, I can deal with them. Let's unmute you first. Unmute all. Um, we can get rid of that, I think. Stop the share. Uh, and uh, I am 